John chapter 11, and it's going to be a sermon entitled, The Resurrection and the Life. Let's pray to the Lord together as we go. God, we come here again. This word is inspired. It is enough. It is sufficient. It is powerful. God, as we stand here today, or sit here today, as we hear this word, might we hear not only what Jesus claims to be able to do, raise us and give us life, but that Jesus is these things, the resurrection and the life. As someone who can say of himself, I am the resurrection and the life, as no normal human being. So we're here not just looking at a man who is a great example, not just looking at a hero of the past, but one who speaks to our present and secures our future, who gives us life in the now and rising in the next. God, as we consider Easter Sunday, I pray that we would treasure the resurrection and the promise that we too will participate in a resurrection if we indeed are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, let anyone here found outside the covering of the Lamb's blood hear the voice, the one who called into that tomb at Lazarus, said, come out. God, may they, like Lazarus, rise and come forth. Amen. <clears throat> that tea may come in handy throughout the sermon, but we'll try to persevere. So, where we are is not where we have been recently. The Gospel of Mark has been our launching pad. But this special Easter Sunday, I thought uh, that this would be a helpful message for all of us because we tend to put the emphasis and the exclamation point on this day on the fact of Christ rising from the dead. And we should. And so why not let that be the emphasis and the exclamation point, there went the bulletin, on every day of our lives. Now I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there to point out what I want to point out to you. And I know that slide says John eleven seventeen. I'm going to set the groundwork for you from verse 1 and following. But we're going to emphasize what follows the most after verse 17. So you're more handy today if you follow along in a Bible for the moment until we get to where we are in the slides. However, the Pew Bible, 897, is the page if that's what you need to reach for. So I want to begin by talking about human progress, the thought of it. 150 years ago, were we to gather in this very building, if this building had existed, we'd be probably, I believe by that point, lacking electricity, air conditioning, heating, cooling when we needed it. You wouldn't have these slides on these screens. A lot of the technology in your pocket would be a century or more away from even being dreamed up. And it was more of a, it was closer then to those primitive times when in innovation and invention had not gone quite so far. But you had what was called 150 years before, so we're back now 300 years, really prior to the founding of our nation. This time of enlightenment when, when so much radical new discovery was made about the nature of the physical world. And progress was the word of the day. And so you had people begin to look at the Word of God and say, either we've got to leave this behind as what was useful to us in the past, but now we have the authority of scientific discovery to guide us from here. Or they were saying, we can take the faith parts, but where it seems to speak to where we're better at discovering and innovating ourselves, we'll leave that aside. Now, human progress has done some amazing things, but God's hand has been on every bit of it. And so you can say, yes, since 1950, the life expectancy rate in the nation has leapt by a decade. Praise the Lord. Well, that corresponds to what Moses already told us in Psalm 90. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Or you read the King James, three score and ten or four score. And so what we haven't been able to accomplish in all of our communication and transportation and medical innovation and all the fantastic Ways that we get fresh food to people faster with more variety. We cannot eliminate what Paul in 1 Corinthians calls the last enemy to be destroyed, which is death. We can't eliminate it. Now, you know there are people who are trying to. I read, and there's an actual 
a laboratory in Arizona. I, I know Donald's headed there. Maybe you'll stop by. A laboratory in Arizona where certain rich folk are paying up to $200,000 to have their bodies frozen in nitrogen called, it's called cryogenics. Uh, the great baseball hitter Ted Williams held that 400 batting average with the Red Sox. He actually had himself frozen cryogenically. But somehow they lost Mr. Williams' head in the process. So if they can reverse, he, 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 was, he was hoping that they would find out what killed him and find a way to fix it and bring him back. He's hoping for a resurrection, but if it happens, then no pun intended, somebody will cry foul for the baseball player. Now, you caught that, so you're alert. Praise the Lord. But as we think about the way we want to progress, we come to the fact that death is an inescapable enemy. It is something that people now just are comfortable to say, well, this is natural course of life. I remember in a science course about 6th or 7th grade, I'd been raised in church, praise the Lord, from a dear family who saw to it that that was always part of our life, significantly. I knew that death was not a good thing. I knew it was to be opposed. And the, the science video, and my teacher wasn't endorsing everything in the video, but my, the, the video said, death is a part of life. Well, that sounds so backwards. <laughs> Because it's where, scientifically, it's where life stops and what comes next. Well, if we cast off the Word of God, we just, we have to make it up from there. We have to make it up. How, what are we going to put in the place of the hope that we find in this book? And so what we come to in Scripture today is a crisis scene. You're familiar with it if you've read the Gospel of John. The death of Lazarus and then the raising of Lazarus. Now, I want to set the stage for you and reach verse 17, and we'll follow from there. But in basically, in verses 1 through 16, to summarize it efficiently, this is a family that Jesus knows and loves personally. He loves people generally and particularly as God. But He loves this family as a human being on earth. This was one of Jesus' places where, if you will, He could kick off His shoes and relax. This was a, like a bed and breakfast for Jesus and, the, and His followers, the twelve. This was the sort of place that in the town of Bethany, the village outside of Jerusalem by about two miles, Jesus could leave the busyness and the hectic culture of the city and come and just take a break. Isn't it nice to have someone you know, you can just come and take a break. You can go over there, and, and I love visiting other people's houses because I'm not responsible for cleaning it so much. I'm not responsible for, I didn't even pay for it. So I can, I can just kick back and relax in so many other places. Sometimes, it, being in my own home, I see everything that, that needs to be done, and it can be stressful. But it says that in verse 1 of chapter 11, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. A certain man, a man Jesus knew certainly. Verse 2, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. That happens in chapter 12 whose brother Lazarus was ill. We're not told how or why or what, what exactly it was. Maybe if they could reach back then, they might test him for COVID. But Lazarus was ill. So it was. In verse 3, So the sisters sent him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So they had a runner, a messenger. There's no texting, no email. They, they employ someone available to them to run to where Jesus is and deliver this message. Now, Jesus had just retreated off into a more country space because at the Feast of Dedication, around the month of December, He had gotten into it so deep with His opponents that they were threatening to stone Him. So He has physically removed Himself from that area. So the messenger obviously must know. Maybe Jesus told Mary and Martha somehow they knew where Jesus was. Now, verse 4, Jesus gets the message. You can imagine Him. Someone comes into the gathering place wherever he is and hey it's very it's urgent Jesus it's urgent you you need to get here Lazarus you love him he's sick come help him now Jesus hears the message and he says this illness does not lead to death it's for the glory of God so the son of God may be glorified through it now that's curious if i look back in john chapter 9 in verses 1 through 3, 
It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They were saying, did the man get bad karma? Did he have something so wrong? Or they have something so wrong in their hearts that the punishment was your boy can't see. Uh, Culturally, people would think that. Verse 3 of chapter 9, Jesus answered, It is not that this man sinned or his parents, but the works of God might be displayed in him. So we have a category now for a crisis in which Jesus will be more glorified than if it had not happened. Now, have you come close in your life or have you actually gone through it losing your Lazarus and yet you walked through and you said, I have seen more of God through this than I ever would have any other way. We will lose our Lazarus at some point. Man's days are few and full of trouble, Job says. Now, for the believer, for those who love Jesus, Look for the Son of God to be glorified. What does that mean? Pastor, you're supposed to say Jesus be glorified. I get it. You would, you, would pull, you would pull me out and say, why didn't you say Jesus should be glorified? If I didn't say that, that's good pastor talk. For Jesus to be glorified is for us to get some encounter, experience, knowledge of Jesus' power, reputation, His love, His nature that wouldn't have come any other way. Can a bad thing reveal the nature and the love of Jesus? The whole thing of Easter is the cross. Pain, agony, suffering. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The giving was unto the cross. And then why? how do we know love there? Because we know that the cross is actually representative of what I owe God as a sinner. But Jesus paid it all for me. Now, we're back to this crisis point. In verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. The Bible makes no mistake. This is a relationship that is deep and real. Verse 6, So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. That's strange. He heard, but he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. The so goes with the Now Jesus loves, so He stayed. Because He's going to reveal something about Himself that the crisis, the the passing of Lazarus will be the perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity. Verse 6. Stayed two days longer where He was. Verse 7 then, after this, He said to the disciples, let us go again to Judea. Then the disciples said to Him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? They're saying like, "Are are you... Thinking straight. Are you really with it? Because if you go there, they're sure to get you this time. Then Jesus gives this really odd answer in verse 9. He says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? Now the sundial would show twelve distinct marks. Are not twelve hours in the day? Well, yeah, that's the way it works. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Now he's being somewhat cryptic. It's like he's wanting them to dig at the meaning of it. But what he means is, when he speaks of the day elsewhere in Scripture, he speaks of the time in which he is living and ministering and working. The night is when they take him away, crucify him. So Jesus is saying, we are, we are going to work while it is day, because I am here, therefore it is day. You work in the daytime in the 12 hours on the sundial. It is daytime so long as I am with you. And so he is assuring them, we're going to go and do this. I'm going to go awaken Lazarus who has fallen asleep. For those who are cared for by God through death, death is but a, it, it looks like a sleeping where they're eventually be awake. That's true for the Christian. Your resurrection body will come soon. We know not when, but it will come. For Lazarus, the rising will come soon. Verse 13, Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant Lazarus taking rest and sleep. So the disciples are, the disciples are like some of, some of us. I'm kind of literal. You know, not real, not real uh, intuitive about this saying that Lazarus is asleep. Rather, they think, well, if he's asleep, that kind of makes sense because he doesn't feel good. 
Won't he eventually wake up? Well, Jesus said, you know, plainly, now he speaks. Verse 14, he told them plainly, Lazarus has died. He's got to speak baby language to them. Lazarus has died. And for your sake, here he is again, sounding almost crass. For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, that you may believe, because remember, this is unto the glory of God. A thing will happen that is going to glorify God. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Thomas, Thomas just says, you know what? We can't convince him to stop, and so he's going to go, so let us go. And I guess if we're go he's going to get stoned, we're going to get stoned too. Let us go that we may die with him. Uh, trying to stop him, but he seems pretty settled on going back up that way. You know somebody who's so persistent on just doing what they want to do that you kind of give up? Just let them at it. It's like, yeah. That's how Thomas felt about Jesus in that moment. You'll, you'll note that Peter would have liked to stop Jesus from taking another step in the direction of his death. Peter would say, no, far be it from you, Lord, that you should die. Jesus would say, get thee behind me, Satan. The disciples, like us, can often misunderstand the move that Jesus is making. So then, we come now to verses 17 through 24. Now it's on the screen. Now when Jesus came, He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. It's a quick walk. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. This is, we, we, we know this. We know when one is grieving, you go and you take them their favorite dish and their fridge can't hold it any longer and they've got 18 casseroles. And then you stick around. You carve out time. Well, customary tradition might have had them carve out as much as a month. Can you imagine a month of it? Now, some of you are going, a month of visitors and casseroles, I'm in. But the tradition had it that these sisters would have had to go about barefoot and in a clearly mournful disposition over their brother's passing. It's important to note about four days there in verse 17, a, a non-biblical, kind of folklore, there's folklore here, Jewish folklore would have said that at, when, when one dies, the soul hovers around the body for about three days, wishing to re-enter, and then goes off. So Jesus, remember, he, he, he waited two days, knowing that He would arrive when it was day four, so that the miracle He's going to perform. Now, nobody knows the miracle's coming until it comes. But we know, because we've read ahead. But when the miracle comes, no one can say, ah, it was within the three-day span. See, the soul just went right back in, and He just happened to time it right. No one can say that. This Lazarus has died and Jesus is going to make sure the crowd gets the gist of it. He's plumb dead. He's shown enough dead. You read the opening line in A Christmas Carol. Have you? Charles Dickens. Marley was dead. Lazarus was dead. And what does Scrooge take out of the casket? Tuppence is tuppence. Had no regard for the dead. These people are going to have all kinds of regard for the dead, but so much of it is to show their pious sensibilities so they stay in the good. We read on, verse 19, Many of the Jews have come to console Mary and Martha. Verse 20, So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, somehow somebody knew. Maybe someone saw Him on His way and ran on ahead. Maybe the, maybe the messenger was sent again and encountered him. Oh, wait, you're on your way. I'll, I'll turn back and let him know. It'll make him feel real good. Now, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. We'll remember that Martha was the industrious, busy, cleaning sort. When Jesus, on another occasion, had come to visit and teach in the house, Martha, Martha, you trouble yourself with many things. Mary was seated at the feet of the Lord learning. Jesus said, Mary has taken the better portion, which cannot be taken from her. So Martha is more business-like and hands-on and Mary is more contemplative and reflective. It's okay to grieve differently than the people around you. You learn a lesson here, a sidebar lesson about grief. It's okay to grieve in different ways. 
There's an extent to which it can begin to debilitate and pull back your, your, your capacity within the Lord's strength to heal. But not everyone encounters loss the exact same way. And so you have some who, who internalize and process and they may get on with life as it seems, but they're carrying this thing for a year. And instead of being like a sharp steak all at once, it's more like a steady numb. And then you have those who take the sharp steak all at once and they hit rock bottom and then they've got to get up fast. Grieving is different according to how God has given us personality. Now, Martha has run on in verse 21 and she, she said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Unless she's just speaking her mind. That's a statement of faith right there. She knows Jesus has done mighty works already. Well, truly, Jesus can heal from a distance. But she would have liked to have seen Him do it. My brother would... That's the first thing. Could you imagine the four days Martha walking to the window? Is He coming? Could you imagine the days before when Lazarus was ill and fading? Lazarus could not get out of bed. Lazarus could not keep down fluid. Lazarus could not stir and awake. He sent the messenger off and watch at the window, watch at the door. When will Jesus come? Sometimes in crisis you watch for God and you wonder, when will He help me? When will He get here? Hey, watch for the glory that He's revealing anyway. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. It wasn't easy for Mary and Martha. But then Jesus did come. Then she says something else. Verse 22, But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus gives her a statement. He knows this is, your brother will rise again like in moments. Real soon. Because Jesus knows what he will do. But Martha, wanting to check her Sunday school boxes correctly, she's a very, remember business-like and very, very, very hands-on, wants to make sure, yeah, I, I studied that lesson. I remember as a second grader, we learned about the resurrection at the last day. Well, it was something the Pharisees would teach. It was true. It was often to think the Pharisees had nothing true to say. They did. They also just layered extra stuff on top of the truth that made it harder to live with. But the tradition would have said, according to various Old Testament Scriptures, that there would be a rising at the last day. It was Job who proclaimed, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He shall stand on the earth. I will see Him, I, myself, and not another. It was Job who said, I will rise. When Ezekiel was given the vision and the experience of prophesying in the valley of dry bones, and they came up and lived, it's a picture of Israel coming back to life at the word of the Lord. In chapter 5, John wrote, there will come a time when Jesus would call and those in the tombs would hear His voice and rise and live. So Jesus knows, yes, there's going to be a coming day, someday God knows when, all who hear the voice of Jesus, who love Him whom He loves, will rise. So Martha has checked the proper Sunday school box. She's far into the future, but Jesus is here in the present. Now then, here's the main thrust of the message. Jesus answers the challenge of death, and death will never be the final word if you are in Jesus. He answers the challenge of death so that death will never be the final word if you are in Him. So, where we are. Verse 25, here is the core of the message today. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. But she's struggling to grasp what Jesus just said. The door is open. Martha, you've walked into it correctly. You're ready to hear more from Jesus. But He's saying right now, 
And hear this, friends. Not just... I have on offer many good things to you, and among those many good things happens to also be resurrection and new life. He's saying, I am these things. Jesus in John's Gospel gives us these I am statements. Seven of them. I am the bread of life, John 6. I am the light of the world, John 8. John 10, I am the door of the sheep, meaning I protect them from would-be attackers and predators. John 10 again, I am the good shepherd committed to watching over those in his flock. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, meaning the source of all true knowledge and all goodness in life. John 6, rather John 15, I am the true vine. So when we join to Him, His life flows in us and through us and you bear fruit. Then in John 11 here, I am the resurrection and the life. Death is not the final word. So, there is a door that Jesus holds open in this statement. He says, Whoever believes in Me, though he die, yet shall he live. Oh, I preach a few funerals already. Only a few. I bet I'm going to preach a lot more. Unless the Lord comes. I'm going to preach as many as I am able. As Ecclesiastes teaches, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of laughter. The wise will lay it to heart and consider. It's not morbid. It's just consideration where we're, all, where we're all one day going to meet with God. But Jesus says this, and this is a powerful thing to consider. Whoever believes in Me, though he die, meaning whoever, while living actively, surrenders and trusts Me. And some people are going to show up to church today, and I praise God that they did. All across this city. All across this state. We're in the Bible Belt. You can still do Jesus-loving things in public and most people don't think you're totally crazy yet in Alabama. And go to Oregon, I don't know. You go to a, a good churches up there. But boy, I hear, I hear there's some challenges. You go to New York, parts of New York, I don't know. Good churches there, I hear there's some challenges. You go, you go to other countries... I don't know. You got a brother pastor I know pastoring in the United Kingdom. Most of his congregants are made up from immigrants from Africa. They're more spiritual than the native Englishmen. Although England has more church history per square mile than any other country on the planet. So, we consider this, that it is, it is correct to say I believe in Jesus, I surrender, but when he says this, really don't count on your good guy resume anymore. There's some who are visiting churches today. If God exists, He probably takes attendance on Easter. Praise God they came. Praise God that they're here. Praise God that they're there. Praise God that they're worshiping. Perhaps. I wonder how many of them really are. I don't know, but I would have them understand this if I could just speak to the people who want to trust in good credit. Whoever believes in me says, that's, that's a singular belief. I, said, I don't believe in Jesse Banks' merits to stand before God and say, aren't you thrilled you made me? And I got a great, boy, I got a great church attendance record. I even got a job at a church. I even paid good money. I paid some John Brown dollars to go to seminary and learn how to read Greek. How am I going to say that to God? No, just as the smallest child, just as the tax collector in the temple, just as anyone anywhere today who wants peace with God, just forget yourself. Just forget it. Just say, I have failed, but in Christ Jesus, my future is bright. And I can get in on what He has to offer me now. That is the beginning of what he calls here the life the life is not something that we merely wait until we have closed these eyes and the heart stops beating and then now suddenly finally we find out what the life is the life is a continuing now in heaven and in eternity it'll be a life free from the presence and the power and the temptations that have known us that have known us here no more attacks from the devil 
No more temptation from the flesh. No more wrestling with the world. No more having to worry about getting a gentleman or gentlewoman job and being sent to training to learn whose pronouns are what. No more of that. And then having to answer for that. No more of that. No more worrying about the course of your nation. I a, learned of a family, I won't mention their name, whose little baby didn't make it at the point of delivery this past week. Long on Good Friday, if I'm correct. I could be mistaken. That child is with the Lord. And this world's troubles are not that child's troubles at all. That child does not know of an 8% inflation. That child does not know of a Putin in a Ukraine or of any other war crime or of any corruption in government or of any corruption in the self. That child does not know of that at all. That child will not have to lose a Lazarus. That dear family had to. But there will come a time when our life, yes, we will be free from the troubles of this world. And yet right now, right now, we can awaken to what is yet to come. We can be awake and alive to what is coming soon. You can be what they call a new creation, Paul says. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old has passed away, new has come. So that you now are growing in the likeness of Christ. You are growing with His church in mission and in service. You are growing with your church family in maturity and in wisdom and in strength. You can know that. Now some people are hearing me say this. Is that true? I've known many miserable Christians. Well, I'm going to say, yes, I have. Known many miserable, seemingly miserable Christians. Well, is that true? I've known many Christians who've fallen and gotten a bad testimony as a result. I've known many Christians who would tell me point blank, I was and then I let God down. I don't know what to do now. Let me tell you what the Scripture would say. It is true that Christians can make it difficult to hear that Christ gives new life and say, yeah, and that's good and I got it. Let's consider this. I'm going to consider this quickly because we've got to move on. Paul teaches us that there is a transformation brought by God in salvation. Ephesians 2, especially. I'm going to read to you from that. Verse 4 and carrying on. But God, previously Paul said, we're dead in trespasses and sins following the course of the world. But in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, not because of that resume or that Easter attendance or the job you had at the church. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If you believe, and He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amazing Christian that you've already got a chair in heaven with your name on it. God has flung the chair around the family table and it says right there, this one is reserved. Seated us with Him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages, this believe the reality of this thing right here. I'm so stunned by people who would rather believe that this world is the maximum of what there is and that there is nothing eternal. Why would you want to be so let down? Why would you want to be so failed by a place where tornadoes can come out of the sky and hailstorms can wreck your car and you can't explain why the little baby didn't make it and you can't explain why there is so much pain. You can't explain why it seems like your preferred leadership doesn't get the chance to lead. You can't explain why you've got your own Lazarus and you're afraid of losing him. But Paul says in the coming ages, in the coming ages, there's more to come. He might show us, God might show us the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, we are on the way to that if we're saved. 
Verse 8 in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Lazarus didn't call, call out of the grave and say, who's going to get me out of here? Jesus looks into the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out! Hear Jesus today if you never have. And receive the gift of God. As we move on in closing, because I got to, I'm having fun. More fun than I expected. You guys have a way of sticking me up here and then... I get carried away. I'm sorry. I want us to see just briefly the compassion of Jesus. We know He's the resurrection and the life. We know if we believe in Him now, we skip death in the sense of actually having to pay the due penalty for our sins in God's eternal judgment in the place referred as hell. We know that. We know if we believe now, we get new life. But here we are in the world and can Jesus sympathize with us when we have lost Lazarus? Well, in verse 28, when, when she... This, remember, Martha gave the right answers. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary. Remember, Mary's seated, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. So here comes Mary. Now, Mary is the sensitive, contemplative one. Remember, Jesus speaks reasoning with, with Martha. Here's what Jesus is going to do with Mary. Now, G Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met Him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. What else is there to do? Got to go cry more. So, she encounters Jesus, sullen, she is. Verse 32, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw Him, she fell at His feet. You can imagine this was not a quick event. Probably stayed there for some time. Fell at His feet. Saying to Him, Lord, if You had been there, my brother would not have died. The same thing Martha said. That's true. This is the best she can come up with right now. She's trying to express her grief while showing respect. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. The greatly troubled is the sense of a horse snorting before charging. Jesus is angry. So when he says, actually, rather, it's for deeply moved, he's deeply moved. He, he is indignant. The footnote in the Pew Bible gives us that. Meaning, he is looking at grief and death, and he says, You should not be here. Grief and death. You are an invader to what was made, what the Creator called very good. You do not belong on this earth. Grief and death. He is indignant. Now, verse 34, and He said, Where have you laid Him? Ah, He knew, I believe. I still personal. They said to him, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty-five. You've, you've memorized the Bible verse today. John eleven thirty-five. Jesus wept. You've achieved that. But think of it. Some consider Jesus to be so other than we are that he can't feel what we feel. But he feels what you feel. And I know some churches pretend that feelings are the only thing and there's no human mind to preach to. I get that. There are churches that maximize on the emotion, but they don't give you the rich content of Scripture. They're not, not our brothers and sisters. They're just maximizing on the emotion and doing that thing. I get that. So some people are afraid. Some people in, in, these, in, in expository preaching churches like what I've got going here, we can sometimes say, well, we've got to get past all this feeling business. No, feel what you feel. And Jesus can grieve with you. When you feel it, God made you with, with this. You, you, you encounter things that you know bring out your joys and your song and your smile. And then you encounter things that cause you to just want to crash. And sometimes that can last a while. But Jesus feels exactly what you feel. And, and I know that we, he, he's, he's hidden from our sight for now. One day He won't be. 
One day he won't be. But he still said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. There is an indescribable, and as a pastor, words fail me to get it, but there's an indescribable comfort where God encounters people at their lowest of lows, and there they have some special fellowship and breaking the bread with the Lord. So Jesus wept. He was angry at death, saying, you do not belong here, and then he weeps. So when the, Jew, the Jews said, see how he loved him, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? They're skeptical and doubtful that he is sincere in anything he's doing. And then verse 38, here comes a miracle. And Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. Not the first time Jesus has likely seen a tomb. But as far as we know in the recorded miracles, it's the first time he's turned a tomb into an exit. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. It could have been the case, we don't know, and it's speculation, it could have been the case that there were more buried bodies in the tomb. Family tombs would have room for six, seven, eight. Make room. We, we understand if you're going to do the work of carving out a cave, you're not just going to probably stick one guy in it. You're going to make room for more. So keep that in mind. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, remember, Martha said, you can, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha said, God will give you what you want. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. The KJV says, he stinketh. He stinketh. Well, yeah. For he's been dead four days. So I guess Martha's faith and power of God came to the point where I don't want to smell bad. So... She's just, she, she's just probably so covered in, in emotion that she's just speaking what immediately pops to mind. Or there'll be an odor for you to dead for a day. Well, Jesus can control death. He can control the smells. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, her lack of belief doesn't stop what comes next. Verse 41, So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he prays out loud. It said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus' whole point is the Father has sent. The Father has sent. The Messiah would be sent. It's not that He didn't just come into the world and get the idea that He would be the Savior of it. No, the Father sent the Son. This was an eternal plan. And so He communicates with the Father openly and out loud. He will verify that He has that ability by the authority over death He will demonstrate. So, Father, I know that, I thank you, you've heard me. And they may believe you sent me. Verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! What if he hadn't said Lazarus? St. Augustine, not the city, but the old theologian, was the first, I believe, to point out that had he not said Lazarus, perhaps he would have emptied out the graveyard. Now, the man who had died came out. Four days of grieving. Four days of pain. Four days of sorrow over a brother lost. Go back. Jesus said, this is for the glory of God. He said this illness does not lead to death, meaning the final end of this man will be something other than what you're thinking. The fi the, I'm going to bring it to the point where it's not what you expect, but for the glory of God. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with cloth. I love how he just walks right. He's so ready to get to Jesus that he won't even take the time to unwrap the grave clothes. I believe that if they hadn't stopped him and taken those grave clothes off, at Jesus' command, for Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I believe he would have ran right up to the voice of the Lord, grave clothes and everything on, and tried to carry conversation. He was in a hurry to get to Jesus. Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life. And he proves it by raising from the dead a dear friend. Does that do us any good? We are prone to grieve when we lose Lazarus in our life, however that looks. A wayward child. 
an outcome you were hoping for and it didn't happen. A strained relationship that over the years is just so difficult to live with. And you may be looking for Jesus to come. And I guarantee you, you love him, he loves you. He'll get through it. There will be the glory of God on the other side. But we need not miss this on this Easter Sunday. We are Lazarus. We do not know when we will be as he was, bound and wrapped and buried. But if we love Jesus, and Jesus surely loves us, first off, we will never die. We will never die. Because Jesus has gone to the cross, risen from the tomb, and ascended in power. Our fellowship is instantly with him the moment this body fails us. So we will never die the second death. We will go to eternal life, which we've had a foretaste of here and now. But we are all Lazarus. There will come a time when we will hear the command of the Lord come out, take off the grave clothes, rise up and walk. You're going to get a glorified body one day if you're a Christian. I know you just heard the word glorified body and you might think you've had one at some point or you might think you've got one right now. I think about a glorified body a lot. I probably won't have this phlegm where you have to kind of fly at a low altitude or you hit turbulence when you talk. It doesn't hurt. It just bothers me a little bit. I won't have contacts in my eyes. I won't have the bad habit of biting my nails. I won't have tendonitis in my knee. I will... I, I guess I can eat whatever. I can already eat whatever I want. But there will come a time when that's sure to stop too. There won't be a visit to a physician for you or anyone there with us. There won't be any downgrade. How does my grandfather have Parkinson's? He loves God. He preached the word for 50 years. He'll get a glorified body. All in God's time. In the in-between, the believer in the presence of the Lord waits and worships, stands in wonder. For to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. One day the Lord will rejoin soul and body, both prepared for life in a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. So when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, it is not merely to agree with the facts. It is to be found in Him in him so much so that when Jesus puts his credit before the father the father sees your credit in Jesus and then you and me Christian are free so on this Easter Sunday praise God he has risen later at the tomb the women would go remember the angel said why seek ye the living among the dead He's not here. He's risen. Lazarus, so far as we know, was raised that day and may have lived on for a good while, but he would eventually return to his grave. Older, perhaps. And with quite a story to tell. He's one of the few who could say, I've been here before. But Jesus would make a permanent exit door out of a borrowed tomb. So be found in him because your death will be a permanent exit door into something far greater than you can ask for or imagine. I hope so. I believe so. I know so. One day I'll get there. Pray with me. Lord, on this Easter Sunday, I just want to return to you praise and glory and honor and worship. Lazarus is there in heaven now. Mary, Martha too. I'm sure they look at that story of that fateful day when you showed up at the tomb and said, come out and say, that is an awesome story to tell. But there's a better story, and they would agree. The story of the gospel, the good news. The Holy One gave His life. In our place, condemned He stood, paid it all, rose in victory, never again to be defeated. May we find in Him our hope and our joy, our resurrection and our life. 
Amen. I want you to look at me. If you have come here today and you heard this message and something of it landed on you, bits and pieces, but you're just not sure whether you would rise at the last or whether when you pass from death, you in fact pass to greater life. You're not sure whether Jesus is yet your Lord and Savior. On this Easter Sunday, would you call on His name if you hear Him calling on you? Do not ignore the call of God. The call of God is distinguishable from every other call on your heart. He speak to you concerning the fact that you don't need to worry about yourself being worthy any longer. Jesus took care of all that. You've got the worthy one you can count on. Remember, He said, who believes in Me. That means I don't believe in myself. I don't believe in my grandparents who attended a good church. I don't believe in the pastor. Believe in Jesus. If you would, simply call on His name. Confess your sins. Believe His gospel. Believe in Him. And receive forgiveness. Eternal life. Friends, church family, Lord bless you on this Easter Sunday. If you are in the spiritual shape, you need prayer, you need counsel of any kind as we fellowship amongst yourselves, pull myself or pull someone you trust aside. I would be honored to pray with you. And uh, if you just say, I don't know what's next, but I know I can't keep on doing the same thing, that's a good place to start. Okay. Now then, I have just a few announcements in closing. As it is uh, the Resurrection Sunday, we will just have this and we will move on and let you have an evening. I hope that you have good family plans. If not, <clears throat> catch on with some folks around you. Say, hey, I'm coming over. Some schedule adjustments to communicate very quickly. We're going to, by the way, I had a song to sing, but if I tried to sing, I feel like, I, I don't know. We'll sing more next Sunday, Lord willing. But we're going to move right into announcements. Thank you for... Those of you who have attended Life Group, I want to make a modification on the way we move forward from here, and I have provided an outline from now to December. Very quickly, what we're going to do is adjust the schedule so that we will have once a month a fellowship and outreach lunch right after church. Can you stand that once a month, a fellowship and outreach lunch? That means enjoy each other and bring somebody with you. 